Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Comotion Labs Fundamentals for Startups. I'm Brady Ryan, and I run Comotion Labs Hardware Incubator. So give me a shout if you have a hardware startup. Uh, for those of you that are new to us, Comotion Labs provides multi-industry lab system hosting startups inside and outside of the UW community in life sciences, biotech, health tech, med devices, robotics, hardware, software, IT, fintech, et cetera. Uh, our startups range from pre-C to series A, employing between two and 15 people each and are variously headed by students, faculty, community leaders, uh, and more. And we have both new and seasoned entrepreneurs represented. While we wait for everybody to log on, I'll make a few announcements. Uh, next week, Kathleen Baxley, the founder of Startup Valuation Resources, will present business model fundamentals. All of our fundamentals for startups uh, presentations are archived on our commercial website under labs and startup training videos. We have a variety of topics that we've covered over the past several years. So if you find yourself some free time, check out our past talks. For the full schedule and to register for future fundamentals, uh, visit commotion.uw.edu slash events. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the little bell. Uh, you'll then be notified of all of our future live streams. Finally, Fundamentals for Startups is funded in part by a grant from the Economic Development Agency. We will be dropping a link into the chat for a very short survey. Please tell us who you are and where you're watching from and how you heard about this event. This feeds directly into our reporting that we do every year to keep this money that we get. It's super important for us and it's very hard to get this data after the fact, so we would be uh, very grateful if you would do that quick little survey. Also supported by Bluetooth, uh, and we're very proud to partner with them this year. Uh, we have a quick video to show you how Bluetooth audio sharing is poised to once again change the way that you experience audio and connect with the world around you. Bluetooth introduced the world to wireless audio. Calling, listening, watching making us safer, more productive, more joyful. It's part of the fabric of our lives. Now, Bluetooth will bring us even closer to each other and our world with audio sharing. It will let us share with others music, our experiences, listening and watching together. The places we go will share with us, enriching our experiences, helping us hear our world. Breaking down barriers between interests, cultures, generations. Introducing Bluetooth audio sharing. Closer. Together. Okay. Uh, today, Minda Bruce, co-founder and managing director at First Row Partners, will present Preparing for Due Diligence, What Comes After Yes and Before the Check. Uh, Minda is the co-founder, managing director at First Row Partners and venture partner at 2048 Ventures in the Pacific Northwest. Prior to First Row Partners, Minda spent time building investor skills and making select angel investments. In 2019, she assumed the fund manager role within Seattle Angel Conference and led record-setting investments in two companies. Minda's depth of experience comes from founding team and leadership roles at StormX, Via Airlift, Copper Six, and Epilon, acquired by Accenture, over the course of 25 plus years. As a leader in the Seattle startup ecosystem, she speaks to audiences about blockchain, art, and entrepreneurship, startup fundraising and early stage investing. Uh, and everybody, I we are really lucky to have Minda presenting here and working within our community. Every time I talk to Minda, she gets me absolutely fired up. Uh, the way she approaches her work is incredible. She cares about founders and really works to reduce the information asymmetry between founders and investor. Um, she is a founders investor and she's uh, working in this space for all the right reasons. Um, very excited to hear what she has to say. Uh, Minda will take questions via chat. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation uh, and we'll ask them at the end. And I'll now turn the event over to Minda. Great. Well, thank you for having me, Brady. I really appreciate it. And I'm delighted to get to talk to this audience about something that uh, due diligence. While it seems like uh, something that's a perfunctory checklist process, it's actually so much more than that. 
And um, I'm delighted to get to, to chat about this because um, I've got a few things to get off my chest and I want to share. So that's what this is really sort of all about. So if I just advance my slides, I'm going to share with you, let's see. There we go. Okay, so this is me. You'll find me on Twitter uh, at Minda Bruce, and I also put my email address up there. Um, there are probably a whole bunch of different vectors of follow up, and they're all fine for you to follow up with me. Um, look forward to hearing from you, um, and I'll present some resources at the end, and you'll you'll get some contact information at the end again. Um, I just really quickly want to go over what I hope you walk away with today and what this outline of my conversation will be. And feel free to put things in the chat and Brady will sort of jump in along the way if needed. Um, but what I hope you walk away with is some clarity on how to navigate and what to expect during this process if you haven't been through it before. And um, as much as possible, I wanna share sort of like what's going on on the investor side during this process and some of the things that you can do to move things along and really close the investment. Um, I'll also cover a few things that tend to sort of pop up during due diligence in my experience and how you might sort of anticipate those things and handle them uh, in a way that, um, you know, creates this really smooth transition um, and make due diligence not such a black box. And I will say that um, and just for context, um, I will address this sort of as a, as a common thread for pre-seed type companies, first time founders who have not been through this before and who are raising like their first institutional or non friends and family kind of funding, right? So really sort of talking about how do you do this and going through it the first time? And that's really where um, we'll be focused today. So we'll go over sort of an overview of what due diligence looks like, how to, uh, you know, some thoughts on organizing and sharing documents overall what to expect from the different parties who are involved and uh, some due diligence you can be doing on your investors, which I think is actually really important. Um, how to keep deal momentum going because ultimately you need to close this. Um, so I'll give you some thoughts on that. We'll talk a little bit about negotiation and communication that happens during due diligence and some thoughts on that and um, we, can, we can chat about that. And then just what happens after you get that check? How do you get off to a good start out and how do you transition out of due diligence and into being on the same side of the table? Um, and then I'll, I'll end with some resources. So, all right, let's get into an overview of the due diligence process. What is the purpose of due diligence in general? And for me, it really is about confirmation of what you think you know, and it's about avoiding future surprises. And really in the best scenario, you're building a working relationship and trust between you and the investor. Um, and so just from a, from a holistic perspective, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, it's not a gotcha exercise, and it's not something where they're looking for a reason to say no uh, or trip you up. Um, and so I think going into it with the idea of what the purpose is will help you navigate it as well. Um, one of the things that's really important to start off with is some expectation setting with the investor who says yes and who you're going into due diligence with. I think it's really fair to ask about their process and their timeline. Um, for, you know, getting through this, what can feel like very open-ended process, um, what kind of references they're going to want so that you can get those teed up in advance, and who's going to be providing the terms and the vehicle for the investment and sort of how is the paperwork part of this going to, to function so that you can gear up what you need on your side and understand what they're doing on their side. So I think it's a really smart place to start by just setting some expectations, some timeline, um, and just understanding who's going to be involved on their side. They may pull in an associate, if they're a VC, they may pull in other people. Um, and just it'll help you um, be in control of the process the more that you sort of have expectations up front that are clarified. Um, one of the other things that I want to talk about that's happening on due diligence on the investor side is what they're trying to do. And that is usually if they're in a VC role, and some angels would do this too, 
they'll create something called an investment memo. And an investment memo, you can look this up, there are thousands of different sort of sizes and shapes of this document. But essentially what it is is sort of a, a way to say, this is why we're investing, this is what we are investing in, in sort of a descriptive sense, what the competitive market is, who the competitors are, and often they'll go out and talk to founders in the adjacent spaces or other venture capitalists and ask them what they think and sort of compile that in as well. Um, and they'll really sort of try to tell the story of why they're making this investment. And I tell you this because I think it's really important for you to understand how much you can support them in that process and, um, and also sort of what they're looking for and what they're building on their side. Um, they're also doing, if they're, if they're really looking at you as um, being your first investor or being a lead investor, they're also doing a legal document review. And I'll cover in the organizational um, slide sort of which documents to put in order, but they are going to ask you for some key documents. And it's really important that you have those teed up and you don't create a delay by having to go away and do a bunch of work. Uh, so again, to that point of deal momentum, you really want to have these things at the ready. Um, and they'll be going through those and often there are, are a few questions. Um, and then, like I said, there's information confirmation. You know, when I was doing uh, due diligence on a company that did um, IoT sensor data management in factories, I actually went on a factory tour with one of their customers. It was super interesting, incredibly helpful in confirming that in fact, you know, yes, their customers are really excited about the technology and what they're doing. And I'm actually seeing the product in use. So there's like this confirmation that is it real? Um, so you may not be having site visits, but the idea is that you're looking to confirm what the founder has already told you. And you really don't wanna see inconsistencies there. If they tell you that they have, you know, 12 months of runway and then they've only got $5,000 in the bank, um, that's a really big inconsistency. And so just understanding that they're looking to confirm what you said, not trying to do a gotcha. Um, and then reference checks. Um, I've done reference checks that are customer reference checks, professional reference checks. And um, those are often just so illuminating for me to understand who I'm getting to know as the founder and um, confirming this, like, it's just, it's another layer of depth where I get to build uh, rapport and trust ultimately with the founder by hearing some, uh, you know, other people talk about their product and their professional experience with them. So those reference checks can be um, really helpful in this trust building part of it and, um, and the sort of depth of getting to know the team and the founder. So just some thoughts on how to prepare yourself in advance. Um, often founders are like, well, I'll have, my attorney's gonna help me handle all of this, or you know, um, the investor will know all these things. And I need to be running my business, fundraising as a distraction. Um, yes, but <laughs> um, it's really important to get yourself a, a little team. Uh, definitely your attorney and also maybe a peer founder with some experience having gone through this because a lot of it is, you know, is this, is this normal? Uh, and uh, ask someone having uh, sort of on your side that can answer those questions is, is super helpful. The best book to read is Venture Deals by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson. I put that in the resources at the end because it tells you things about side letters and liquidation preferences and cap table and dilution and all these things that are the levers of um, bringing investors and founders together and what, how to set yourself up for success and understand what you're negotiating and what really matters and what, you know, you may not need to focus on so heavily. So really important that you take the reins and educate yourself so that you know um, what, uh, to ex what, uh, what you want out of the process and that you are ready to have the conversations uh, real time without having to go and do a bunch of homework afterward to find out um, how to answer the questions. Okay, so my friend Kate is here in town. She's the fund manager for Sale Angel Conference. And this is what she had to say about due diligence. Um, that it is about the investor getting to know your team um, it, she talks about the dynamics of, you know, 
seeing them in action with these exchanges and documents, it's much more of a working relationship, and that she gets the opportunity to see their flexibility, their coachability, how they use time, how responsive they are, and um, really, uh, you know, it helps her get to know the team. So just a little bit on sort of an, an angel investor's perspective, a fund manager's perspective on what it looks like to have a successful relationship there. All right, so let's talk about organizing the documents themselves. Um, in some cases, non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, are essential. Um, but if, but in, uh, in my world of pre-seed investing with software, um, well, there may be some patents that are being filed. I'm not seeing any of that IP anyway. Um, I really won't sign NDAs as an investor. Um, but in life sciences and other places where it's very IP heavy, that may be very much um, part of the process. So really understanding up front how disclosure is going to work in your case is important. Um, I've seen founders sometimes really try and push for investors to sign an NDA when it wasn't really appropriate because what they were really just looking at was the finances of the company, like P&L statements and things like that. And in that case, the investors really sort of pushed back and didn't like the lack of transparency feel that they were getting from the founder. So important that you understand sort of some of the norms for what your investment type is and how NDAs and disclosures will work. So there, you know, when you're setting up what's called a data room, which is all these organized documents, you have a couple of different routes you can go. And I would say the most sort of lightweight is a Dropbox or a Google Drive of a bunch of different folders with a bunch of different documents, and you're giving access and revoking access and, and all of that to the different investors. And so that is one sort of way that you can do this. And it's probably the most lightweight. Then there's the DocuSend kind of model where you're tracking and seeing who's accessing what, and you, know, you can create a lot more permissions and things like that. Um, and then even in like life sciences, for example, you might use a platform like Venue Systems that is far more comprehensive, watermarks everything, um, you know, really tracks down to the detail what documents are being accessed and when and versioning, and it's far more comprehensive. It's really purpose-built for due diligence. So there are sort of different levels of um, what you might choose, and so think about your platform a little bit. And then when you have a file structure and you're managing um, access privileges, you want to really break things out so it's very straightforward to see, um, you know, what things are. So you might have something that says, um, con you know, customer contracts, and then they click on that folder and then there are all the customer contracts or, you know, cap table. Or you just make it very orderly for what, you know, people are, are looking for and make it easy for them to find. And then here's the trick. Keep these things updated in perpetuity with the board meeting minutes and the contracts and all the things so that when someone comes along and says, hey, I'd like to you know, make an investment in your company that really quickly you're able to mobilize on that or get ready for your next round. You don't wanna to have to redo this work. So it's much easier to keep your data room up to date than to try and sort of let a lot of time go by. Okay. So this is uh, my friend, Alan. He's a tech executive here in town. He's also an angel investor. And uh, this is his reminder that don't forget you have a business to run. That is the job. Um, but, you know, this can take a lot of time. So organizing it, getting it ready, and then keeping it up to date, um, that's really, I think, something that he would emphasize having seen this a bunch of times um, as a founder, as an angel investor, and um, really making sure that you're organized is gonna help you manage your time well in this whole process and sort of planning out what this is going to be. Some investors will require more time than others and more depth. But here are, here's a sense of this kind of do oh, documents you're gonna to wanna to organize. Um, and I'm gonna emphasize the first one quite a bit, which is your financial model and your unit economics because this is something that, as I was talking to another colleague of mine, Neha Kara, um, at 2048, she was saying that this is often something that when she goes in and looks at a due diligence folder, she finds doesn't have the level of detail that she is expecting. 
So she likes to see monthly projections for the first 18 months and then maybe quarterly or annual beyond that. But um, really making sure that your investor sees that you have a coherent story of numbers that go along with the pitch that match that the narrative of the pitch matches the numbers and that you want those two to really because some people uh, you know investors will are really spoken to through spreadsheets and so understanding what a communication device that is is i think really important and so that's one of the things that is going to get uh some attention from every single investor that comes into your data room you're going to want your formation documents and um all of the you know legal paperwork uh, together and, uh, you know, available there, representations and warranties, your cap table and the vesting schedule. Um, you can have varying levels of detail of your cap table, but really, um, I, you know, as an investor, I want to know who's in control. Uh, I had a situation one time where the CEO was not the one that had the majority ownership. It was actually her co-founder. And we actually asked them to, to make that change. Um, because we felt that it was really important that the CEO have that kind of control. So these are kind of some of the things that can come up when people look at that. They're looking to see, you know, um, where the ownership is really divided and to make sure that it makes sense because that's the cap table that they're joining. They want to make sure that everything um, lines up there. And having a simple cap table is, um, and keeping it simple is one of the, you know, best ways to not have any trip ups. Um, when you get into the due diligence phase and have to answer questions. Um, board meeting minutes, financial reports like P&Ls. I've had companies come into due diligence and bring me bank statements. And that's really not okay. Um, when you're seeking investment, you're looking to be a steward of capital to make it get to work. And so you need to show that you've got the financial controls and the accounting systems that are ready to go so that you can produce reports and be running your business. Because one of the things that I always want to make sure of is that you're on top of your cash position, that you know how much money is going out the door and coming in. And um, if, if I don't feel like you have that um, in place, then I'm going to find that to be a, a, you know, a really strong concern. Um, Fundraising documents from any other capital you've raised from maybe friends and family, things like that. Contracts, agreements, and terminations. If you've had to have a separation with a prior co-founder, things like that. Um, any top level sort of patent information and in tech specs or architecture. These are all really great things to have. If any of it you think might trigger a question or confusion or concern, address it up front. Um, don't wait for your investor to ask the questions or raise a concern. Um, I've had to, in my own sort of uh, startup history, uh, look at creating sort of a corporate timeline of like, okay, you know, these three co-founders and then this one left, here are the documents for that, that person's departure. Then we had, you know, just really stepping through and addressing up front what the documents really supported so that uh, investors could get a sense that uh, everything was all tight and um, that the IP was secured and that we had the appropriate sort of employee uh, and co-founder comings and goings documented properly to protect the company. Um, so some extra credit things um, are some videos, some industry reports, because again, if you can help um, share uh, information that guides their um, investment memo, you're really helping them out and uh, you can feed them things and then they'll go validate it on their own, but it's really nice if you can give them a, a solid start and some information. And your fundraising deck and team bios and references, just organizing all that, putting that together also makes it easy. If you have a lead investor who wants to sort of bring in co-investors, you're giving them marketing material for you. And so I think that it's uh, a great service to you to pull all that together and make it easy for someone to do that. You might even put something like a document together that has short blurbs about you or, you know, uh, news articles, anything you can think of that might serve you well for marketing, because ultimately uh, a lead VC investor that comes in is going to want to help you fill out the round with other investors. They're going to need to tell other people about you and why they're investing and, you know, help them uh, help you in this case. Okay, so Laura Malcolm is a local founder of Giving Kind, 
And uh, she had this to say, and uh, it's really kind of going back to my point about financial models, which is know your numbers inside and out. Laura is great at this. When I was doing diligence on her company, she was driving the spreadsheet and showing how, well, if we grow at this rate here, and she changed the number, and then everything would change, and then this and that. And I could tell she knew her business, her model inside and out. It gave me a tremendous amount of confidence that she understood her business and what the levers were for growth and margin, customer acquisition costs, et cetera. And, um, you know, so the fact that this is what she wrote me when I asked her about due diligence, I thought, well, you know, this is something that she really did exceptionally well. Um, I think she impressed me as an investor in being able to justify and explain her financial projections, and they matched the narrative from her pitch deck. And so there was a tremendous amount of cogent uh, thought that was translated in both the numbers and in the pitch that um, I think she had a very successful fundraising round. And I think definitely that's part of why she was extremely well prepared. Okay, so a little bit about what to expect from different types of investors. I've thrown around things like lead investor and you know follow on investors, angels, angel groups. Let's talk about that for just a moment because I think that um, everyone, it, there's, this is a very uneven process. And um, I think that the more that you understand what different people's roles are in this and what they're looking for and how they are helping you in this way, um, then you can, you can really sort of get the, you can ask the right questions up front and you can kind of understand what's going on on their side. So a lead investor VC in my world in pre-seed is someone who is making the most significant investment doing the most amount of diligence and really representing you to follow on investors through introductions and information providing. And they're really working behind the scenes on your behalf to help you fill your entire round. Often at 2048, when we're leading a round, we actually really help them figure out like, how much more do you wanna raise here? Can we raise the cap and then raise more? How soon? Like it becomes a real strategy conversation. But prior to that kind of conversation, the lead will have done all the due diligence, the reference checking, the legal checking, the, um, you know, detailed, uh, you know, vehicle for investment, and you really would have nailed things down. So um, they're doing probably the most comprehensive. Follow-on investors are fantastic because they can come in, they can lean on a well-known lead and investor that they trust. They can get some information through your data room. You may have a, a shorter list of documents that you provide to those folks than to your lead, but um, they wanna come in and, and see a lot of the same things and have that confirmation of what they're hearing be reinforced by what they find in your data room. Angels are individuals who are investing their savings, their own money, and they are as individual as individuals are. And so um, one of the things I will say is that some of them are very light on their due diligence and others will wanna write a very small check compared to your other investors, but want a tremendous amount of your time to provide documents and diligence information. And they'll want to dig really deep. And sometimes that can be a sign that um, they're going to want to work with you in that way after the investment. So if you're not comfortable during the investment, then or during the due diligence, then you're likely to be uncomfortable with that relationship going forward. So it's something to really think about. And I think that happens most frequently with angels, but it could also be true of uh, any other investor that you bring in. But I think it's especially um, one of those things to look for when you're talking to angels. Um, angel groups uh, have different kinds of due diligence. In Seattle Angel Conference, one of the, <laughs> the last four weeks, we take the final six companies, we put them through a really comprehensive due diligence process with a small team working with them. And it almost becomes like an accelerator because there is a, a deep report written, people sort of probing all different areas of the business. It actually can be a tremendously helpful, valuable experience for the company. It takes a lot of time, but uh, every company that's come out of it has said that they're prepared for anybody's due diligence after having gone through that. Other uh, angel groups might have a committee that works on a report, but again, uh, for angel groups, it's important that you understand if they're making a group decision or if they're all making individual investor decisions. So really knowing 
um, how the, how the uh, investment works during their due diligence is important with angel groups because sea change has like a screening committee. You know, they have a very step-by-step -step process and they go to a vote. Uh, there's a due diligence report. Sometimes that due diligence report can be shared. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things that you would want to ask about as you're going into these um, conversations with different investors and understanding that a lead investor is going to do the most amount of work and really be your captain of your round. And um, a little bit about information sharing because A, investors talk to each other. So you want to make sure that you're consistent. When you say that so-and-so is investing and then they call up that person and they're like, well, I'm looking at some due diligence, but I'm not totally sure yet. Um, that inconsistency can be devastating to your credibility. So really be careful about, um, you know, stretching and uh, being optimistic, but then ending up being inconsistent and really harming your credibility. Um, Multi-party communication and leverage. I would say um, be very careful about trying to play investors off of each other in order to try and negotiate better economic terms. Um, and I say this because I think that it's really easy to get burned and to lose credibility in this process and that, um, you know, you're best giving, you know, your information, developing these relationships. To, if you have the opportunity to choose from multiple investors to work with, make those choices carefully and thoughtfully, but try not to do the, you know, deal making, wheeling deal where you're sort of saying, well, I've got a term sheet from this one and a term sheet from that one and try and that's not worth it. Uh, the economics aren't really worth it. The uh, credibility and, um, you know, uh, the ultimate sort of lack of transparency. It's just not what you want to develop during due diligence in my mind. Um, so I would discourage you from thinking that that's what this phase is about. Um, but there is some negotiation and communication. And let's talk a little bit about some questions to ask about your investors. You should be doing due diligence too. So um, ask them for founder references and um, call them up or email them. And the kinds of things that you wanna ask are here on the screen, but especially the last point. Do you feel comfortable sharing bad news and problem solving with this investor? And that really speaks to everything um, because a good investor is the one that you're wanting to call when things are not going well and um, that you feel open and communicating with them. Um, you also wanna know what kind of strategic help they are actually able to offer. Some people will talk about, um, you know, the industry expertise that they're gonna bring or the customers that they can introduce you to, things like that. And this is a way to sort of validate the kind of um, value that your investor is, is bringing and um, making sure that matches up with what your expectations are. And then really, do they use your time well is an important one. You'll start to get a sense of that during the due diligence process, but it's a great question to ask other founders with their experiences too. Okay, deal momentum. Minda, I have a question yeah. real quick. You, you talking about doing due diligence on your investors, and that's something that I have founders ask me sometimes when they're talking to an investor and maybe it doesn't seem like the greatest fit and maybe there's like some minor alarm bells going off because everything you're saying about authenticity and honesty, right? That cuts both ways. Um, yeah. totally and does. at some point though, if you're an early stage company that is running out of cash and somebody who sets off some alarm bells has a check for you, that starts to look, you know, Kind of tempting. How would you suggest founders navigate that when they don't have competing offers from different investors, but they have somebody that might want to write a check, but they don't exactly pass the investor due diligence test with flying colors? I would say two things to that. One is, are they going to chase off other good investors because someone doesn't want to be in the cap table with them when they all have to sign off on something and they're seen as being a difficult person to work with by other investors. So that's something to think about. And then the other thing would be to think about, is this a person that's gonna write the check and walk away? Or is this a person that's gonna to wanna to be calling you frequently and saying, how's it going? You made that sale yet? <laughs> um, sure. 
And so I think it's also understanding how you're going to be working with that person long term. Um, and so that might be a conversation that you have really openly by saying, you know, during this due diligence process, you asked quite a bit about cash flow. And I'm wondering if that's going to be an ongoing concern you have. How do you want to work together long term and really sort of interview them and capture that and see if you like what you hear? Um, but I think that you can very diplomatically sort of probe into um, how they want to work with you in the future and sort of see if those red flags are something that you should really be paying attention to. Um, but I would say those are sort of the two things. It's making sure they are not a problem with other investors and then making sure that they are not getting in the way of you running your business. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. And I love what you were saying about interviewing the investor. And that's, to me, some somewhat different from due diligence on the investor. Um, there's kind of this, everybody knows about the, the information asymmetry between investor and startup, right? But the power asymmetry is huge, too. And I feel like so many founders, especially early stage and first time founders, just like, oh, investors are, you know, sitting on this throne and they're fantastic and they're, uh, and they're, you know, you can't question them and you can't push back. And I just love hearing from an investor like, no, push back. You are bringing a lot to the table as the founder. They should, they should be thanking you for getting to yes. that. Yes, I agree. That's great. Anyway, keep going. I just wanted to, so, yeah, wanted to absolutely. break in with that. But ultimately, you are the closer. And so in this power asymmetry, you're the one who's trying to close. And so it's hard. So everything I've said beforehand about being organized, asking the right questions, setting expectations, all of those things are really helping you with keeping the right deal momentum for the investor that you want to have on your team. And you want to really talk to them about like what it's going to be like to work with you long term and all these things. So being responsive is incredibly helpful. I've seen founders really lose investors um, because uh, they think, oh, well, I can just get back to them next week. Um, if you have to get back to them next week, at least say, I need to get back to you next week. Is that okay? You know, or, or, you know, like understand their time crunch. Don't go dark on them. Sure. Um, and you can, sh you know, if you're not hearing from them and you're sort of expecting to, share some relevant news or updates. Um, find a reason to reach out and check in. Um, and again, thinking about them developing that, you know, investment memo. If you can sort of fill in some blanks for them here and there, um, that's just always really helpful in sort of keeping things on track. And now that I am on the investing side, I understand that it is is so easy to get distracted. So mm -hmm. easy to get distracted. And I'm guilty of it. And uh, so often it really is the founder that needs to sort of continue to keep on top of the investor and being top of mind. Um, you really don't want to let the deal go cold because that yes and that excitement uh, at the beginning of due diligence, you really need to maintain that and get the check. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so don't let things go on too long. Um, you really want to try and keep this as short as possible. And again, that helps when you're setting up right? expectations up front to then be able to work on the same timeline as them True. so that you know when things are taking longer than they should and you're yeah. not wondering. Yeah. Um, oh, and just a little bit about like when you do and don't have leverage, Brady, you were kind of saying this, like sometimes you just don't have the luxury of having yeah. more than one investor that's looking at you. Um, and so just understanding that you really only have two ways of having leverage in the funding conversation. One is if your business is going gangbusters, mm -hmm. then investors are going to be, yeah. you know, plentiful. And um, or if you and if you have the situation of having multiple investors, that's great. But don't think that you have leverage in that situation when you're really just talking to one investor and they know that that's OK. They shouldn't mm -hmm. be trying to take advantage of you. But also, um, be careful how you play your cards. Be yeah. a good steward of the information and the relationship and, um, you know, just uh, don't try and, and get bravado and think that that's somehow going to be respected or that you're a tough negotiator is a, is a great thing. You want to really demonstrate all those kind of game playing things just really won't work. So yeah. I would say to avoid that and really understand when you do and don't have leverage. You've said the word authenticity a couple times. 
And I think that, that this is calling back to that, you know, be authentic. If you have a bunch of offers, you can talk about it. But if you don't, don't, yeah, don't puff out your chest and pretend that you have leverage. And that goes back to what you were saying about, you know, answer the questions early and don't hide the bad news. Just, I, I think that it's, it's, it's easy for founders to look to hide bad news and hide some bad information, squirrel it away. And hey, if it comes up in due diligence, we'll address it. But if you had a terrible quarter, talk about the terrible quarter, right? I mean, I Absolutely. think that people want to hear I, bad I news early. So much more when, I mean, I know how things are just such a mess sometimes in your actual business. You want to share a professional view of that, but you want to share a truthful view of that. And I actually like to ask founders for the backlog of their investor updates to see, primarily to see how they yes. share them. Yes. Yes. I love that. So I also um, love, I also love, I've seen, I've seen startups when they're pitching for like their second round or their seed after the pre-seed or their A after whatever to show like, hey, these were our financial projections when we raised 18 months ago and we missed them and here's why. Or, hey, these were our projections and we nailed them because you have to imagine so many people are saying like, yeah, 60, 18 months, we're going to be at, you know, $2 million annual recurring and then they're nowhere near it. But then the follow on rounds don't say anything about that. And other conversations don't harken back to these. I mean, I think it shows strength to be able to talk about what's hard. Mm -hmm. And if I, if, you know, as an investor, what I'm trying to find out during due diligence is, are there any surprises? Yeah. And will there be any surprises? And the more that you can show me that that's not going to be the case, then I'm delighted to sit on the same side of the table as you and be mm -hmm. 110% on your team and your supporter, your advocate, et cetera. But it's hard when you feel like you're not getting all of the information. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So with deal momentum, just sort of understanding your leverage and how you can move things along, but without trying to say like that you've almost got another term sheet coming or you know any of that kind of stuff that just sort of can wrinkle. Okay, um, Alex is the you know person I work with over at 2048. He ran Techstars as the managing director for five years. He's founded four different companies and uh, he's got a successful fund with 2048. Um, he's also got a blog um, called startuphacks.vc, and um, he publishes on a pretty regular basis. And one of the things that he published was six things um, that founders should expect during due diligence. So I pulled some of that here today. And he ends with this line, which I think is super helpful, which is um, reminding you to pair up with a trusted investor or another CEO who can help you through the process pay attention to things that really matter and leave the rest up to your lawyers. I've had companies look at the boilerplate language and try to negotiate it. <laughs> it's like, that's not helpful. <laughs> um, and uh, so really having uh, sort of someone who can tell you, this is normal, that's not. This is market rate, this is a market thing, this is something that's maybe not. Um, because so much of this can be read a couple of different ways that having that on your team and, and, you know, lawyers are really well intentioned, but I really think that sometimes a founder's a CEO's perspective can help you really sort of, um, you know, develop your own judgment, not just let someone else's judgment be a substitution for yours. Um, some attorneys are really risk averse and others are not. And um, so depending on who you're working with, it's just good to have sort of a couple of different perspectives so that you're using your judgment, not someone else's. So that's a little bit about what I'm talking about here, which is like some of the things that can come up during due diligence that ultimately require a little bit of judgment calls. Um, sometimes a lead investor might produce something called a side letter which um, asks for information rights, asks for a board seat or a board observer seat, or wants a liquidation preference. This is where you will have read venture deals and understand what's going on in this scenario and where it is and isn't appropriate, where it isn't, isn't normal. These side letters are where things, um, you know, you really wanna make sure that this is, um, you know, a, a, a fair and equitable um, ask. 
on behalf of the investor. Vesting schedules, sometimes um, investors will look at a vesting schedule and say, whoa, as a founder, you're two and a half years in and you're just getting your first round of funding and you're gonna own all that equity and be able to leave in a very short amount of time. That doesn't make me comfortable. I'd like you to reset the clock. So these are things that have come up during due diligence sometimes. How much runway you have, and how much runway you will have at the end of your round, and what your budget is. And if they see things that are, you know, salaries and hiring plans that are way off from their perspective, they may really push back on that. And, uh, you know, some investors will push back on founder salaries and making sure that, you um, you're, especially if you're pre-revenue, that you're keeping those really below market and that you're um, hiring your team with, um, you know, salaries that are commensurate with what the market is for, the, for a startup. So really being sure that um, you've got agreement on that can also come up during due diligence. Um, if you're an LLC and converting to a C-Corp, that's something that can slow you down if you're trying to do that during due diligence. So I would say that if you're serious about going out for funding, then you should already be a C-Corp. But um, that's something that can happen. If founders have put loans into the business and have it as a promissory note, an investor will want you to convert that into an equity position. Because when a company is liquidated, debtors get paid back first. And also, if I give you an investment of $500,000 and you've loaned the company $500,000, you could just take that out and repay your loan. So I don't want that potential scenario. I want that money to go to work in the company, not repaying a founder loan. So um, really thinking about those kinds of things and making sure that those are well documented in terms of in the money you've put in and being converted into an equity position. Um, former founders and terminations are another thing that has come up, both with making sure the IP is positioned properly and that the terminations and all of that were done in, you know, with all the right legal paperwork. And I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I just know that things can get sort of convoluted and um, are often something that needs to be buttoned up. So it's not fun to have to go back and ask an ex-co-founder to sign a new document. So this is something you want to really prepare for in advance, making sure that all this is taken care of. But sometimes I have seen it come up during due diligence and then have to be taken care of. And this is where you can lose deal momentum is when these things are coming up. And then just not having your IP correctly documented um, for having um, people work on your project under no agreement at all is worse than having them having done the work under a bad agreement. Um, so just understanding who's touched and potentially developed your IP and making sure that all of it is locked in tight to your company, because that's part of what your investors are investing in and they don't want some to be able to come back with a claim later. Um, so, okay. Onboarding and ongoing success. You get the check. Now it's really, acknowledging that milestone with your new investors, reinforcing the communication cadence. If you, you know, usually the first person you're really bringing on board is that lead. How do you bring them onto your team? Start to get strategic with them about filling the rest of your round, sharing those materials, um, keeping your data room updated, you know, maybe write a blog post and think about the PR and pictures and all those kinds of things that support the investor and support you in um, sort of spreading the word about the growth of your company and what's coming. Um, and then be ready to help the next founder, please, <laughs> because um, everyone needs someone who's been through this because it is sort of a navigational thing, not a checklist. Okay, so I'm going to end with some resources and then we can take a few questions. Um, one is, again, a reminder to read what I think of as sort of the Bible of VC, which is Venture Deals by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson. Through the Kauffman Foundation, they also offer this as a distance learning course. And I did it a couple of years ago with a small group. And oh my gosh, I learned so much. It is a really great way as a founder to understand investing. And if you want to be an investor, it's a great way to understand um, the intricacies of how uh, investments are made and how the progression works and what the outcomes are and how they reward and um, and sometimes cut out investors at the earlier stages. If you're interested in angel investing, all of this, any of this 
Venture Deals has a real 360 on this process. It's a great book, total reference. Um, and again, Alex's blog article, Six Things Founders Should Know, um, StartupHacks.vc. He's also really active on Twitter. Um, and then Seattle Angel Conference, are, I, I think of as a local gem because it not only trains angel investors, it really uh, is a place for founders to come. There is no too early to apply to Seattle Angel Conference because I've seen companies come through two or three times and get a little further each time in this sort of 10 week process, which is like a slow motion shark tank. Um, and then, like I said, at the end, uh, the last four weeks, we take the final six companies that the investor group has voted on and uh, go into a due diligence process where we all break into teams and write a report. And then, so what you'll see here are two dates. One is the date where you submit and get at the top of the funnel. And that's February 25th this time. They run it twice a year. And then May, is it May 21st, May 12th? I have my screen covering it up. Okay, May 12th. So on May 12th, they'll have a, a virtual presentation in six companies will present and six due diligence leads will also present. And you'll get to hear a little bit about the due diligence process through that. Um, and then they, the investors vote and one or two companies will win the investment. And uh, I think it gives you a really good chance to see who's getting early stage investment, what kind of uh, story they have, what kind of, um, uh, you know, traction, et cetera. But it's never too early to start getting this feedback um, from investors. Uh, so I, I just really think quite highly of it as both a, both a place for new angels and a place for new founders. Um, and then also we run something uh, at First Row Partners called Deals and Drinks, which is open to everyone. It's an educational social event where we grab a wind down beverage at about five o'clock. And um, Ben here from... Uh, Elevate Capital, he always does a really cool cocktail. <laughs> so we're always wondering what Ben's drinking. Other people bring sparkling water, but um, we hear from a founder and um, we talk in advance about how we listen to founders. And then on the other end, we have a discussion as investors. Even if you're not an investor, you can come as an investor and talk as an investor in the group of VCs, angels, students, founders, but we all act as an investor listening group. And um, we really try and break down the what we heard and what we think and what are our open questions because none of us are really trying to actually make an investment. But what we are trying to do is think about how we form judgment. And uh, I think that that's something that is interesting and, and is open to everyone. So um, contact me, my email's there. Uh, if you want to know more. So I think we have a couple minutes for questions, Brady. I, I hope you have a few queued up. I do. We have a lot of questions. Um, really quickly, a couple things. Uh, just to echo for all the listeners what Minna said about Seattle Angel Conference and the book Venture Deals. Super great. Seattle Angel Conference is an awesome resource for us here. Uh, Minda, you are such an awesome resource. I, I seriously just get so excited every time we talk. Love your approach. Lo thank you so much for sharing all this. Yeah. Um, Plenty of questions from the audience. Um, uh, let's see, where do we want to start? Um, somebody asked, you, you know, you mentioned the CEO who had fewer shares than the co-founder, and that was an issue for you. Mm -hmm. um, w w why is that an issue? Why do you want the CEO having, having more control? Yeah, because the co-founder could fire her, first of all. Sure. <laughs> so that's a huge risk. And I want her to be able to run the company and make the hard decisions. And so it's really important for me that they be in the majority and um, have the control. There are two things that are really important. There's price for the price and control. That's really what all of this boils down to. And I want to make sure that the right people have control and that that also that founders aren't too diluted too early and then therefore become more like employees and the investors are really sort of in charge of the company. And then the, then the founders just want to leave because it's better to go just get another job than to keep pushing up, pushing water up a hill. Um, and so we look at a lot at control on the cap table. Sure. 
Uh, one thing, we've had a lot of folks uh, asking for the PowerPoint, and I know you're going to share that. As an additional carrot, or maybe it's a stick, we're going to share the PowerPoint with the folks that fill out that survey that we need for our EDA reporting. So fill out that survey, tell us where you're from, and we will send you uh, the PowerPoint. Um, I'm sure we send it to you anyway. We probably will, but please fill that out. Um, I, I had a, a, a question. You talked a little bit about founder salaries, and that's something that always seems kind of contentious. At, can my pre-seed stage CEO write a salary into his fundraise? At what point does that start to seem a lot more reasonable? I mean, if this person has marketable skills and they could be in the private sector making a bunch of money, um, you know, how should early stage companies think about that salary question? Yeah. Um, I don't think founders should have to, um, I, I think that it's, it's, um, it's really important as investors, I believe, that we support founders and being able to make a living. And I just think that, especially when you're pre-revenue, uh, you really haven't proven that you have something that is, you know, I, I believe that the majority of founder salary should come from customer revenue, not from investor capital. Because the idea of investor capital is that I want you to put that money to work as a multiplier. Mm -hmm. And if it's going to founder salaries, it's not as much of a multiplier because your incentive is really the ownership stake that you have in that company. And that's what should be your multiplier and motivator. But you should be able to hire good talent. And that is a multiplier. So I want my money to go where there's a multiplier effect. And so I understand that founders need to do what they need to do uh, mm -hmm. to earn a living. And I respect that. Um, I think it's also uh, I want to see more entrance into the founder ecosystem. And I think that it's exclusionary to say that they should have to take a zero salary. Yeah, so, high barrier to entry for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and so um, but also make sure that you're ready to, to do this because it is a hardship. And it's uh, something where another thing that I did as a founder, which I'm really glad to share, is uh, we would, it, me and my co-founder would always set sort of goals. We would say like, okay, we're going to work on this for six months. And if by the end of six months, we don't have X amount in monthly recurring revenue, we have to really question if we should continue. And then we run like crazy and our families support us and everyone's on board. And then we get to that point and we have, have a checkpoint. Um, and so I think it's also really important that you value your career time um, and not just the money. Um, and so just really be thinking about that uh, in combination. But I really do think that founders should be able to draw some salary, but especially pre-revenue, that's very challenging sure. to sort of put forward to an investor. Yeah. Uh, okay, Alexander N. asked, uh, you know, you, you, when we were talking about financial documents, you said that bank statements are not enough. What is enough? What does good financial documentation look like? Uh, are we talking like financial statements or? or yeah, uh, like if you have QuickBooks, for example, mm -hmm. and you can generate a P&L, profit and loss statement, um, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement, then you're in pretty good shape. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to let me know that you're gonna be a good steward of the money because what I don't wanna have happen as an investor is for my investment to go in and then before you become in, at the next inflection point and investable that you run out of money. Um, that's, that's something that we always wanna make sure you have enough money in the bank and if you can't um, be in control of that. If you, if that's, you know, uh, something that I don't feel you're really on top of, then I'm going to ask you to really, I mean, they're going to really be concerned and that might be a reason not to invest because they just don't have their business side together. Um, or it may be that I feel like you need another team member or need to somehow address that. Can you hear me? I'm having computer issues. I can hear you. Okay, great. I Zoom is completely frozen for me, so that's good enough. Um, I, more about financials and specifically financial projections for early stage pre-revenue companies. You know, you you're making guesses, right? It is a pyramid totally. of assumptions built on assumptions built on assumptions. Yes, is that still valuable? And how do you see? Um, I mean, you were talking about Laura Malcolm. Ford gives a presentation on startup financials, sort of like what I think Kathleen's going to do in your next session that you do. Um, but he starts out by saying startup financials, 
why bother? <laughs> because you're always going to be wrong. Okay, so um, anyway, what he, what he says, and I really believe, is that it's important to sort of share what your assumptions are because we have to agree that they're good assumptions and realistic and that you've actually captured all the right assumptions and um, that you do know how to tell a story with numbers and create projections and that you're good at spreadsheet work. <laughs> um, so there's sort of a, a proof uh, there. Uh, and also that you're sort of forecasting where your unit economics are going, how your hiring plan is affecting your cash flow, and that you can do those kinds of predictions. So there's sort of the financial modeling necessity that I want to make sure a founder has a good handle on. And then, um, yes, they're all going to be completely wrong. But I want to see that you've got those first 18 months that you really have a plan. Because I'm investing in you for the next 18 months to make sure you can get to the next inflection point before you run out of money. And then I want to see at the other end, I want to say, do you have the rosy projections and trajectory to be a hundred million dollar company? Because I'm a venture investor and that's what I am looking for. And, and if, if that doesn't look possible to you, then and it doesn't look possible to me, um, certainly. Um, be, so that makes me think that maybe a better kind of investment vehicle, not VC money, is for you. So showing that you've got a very concrete plan, but then you also have rosy projections that you can play out. And I see ambition in there and I see practicality over here. Oh, now I can't hear your voice. You're on mute. How about now? I can hear you now. Oh, wow, I don't know. Okay, sorry about Zoom, everybody. Um, but. That's all we have time for, Minda. I'm so thankful for, for you giving us your time and sharing this wisdom. Um, really happy to have run into you and so happy that you are in this uh, ecosystem helping out these founders. Uh, as a reminder to everybody else, next Friday at noon, we'll be hearing from Kathleen Baxley, founder of Startup Valuation Resources, uh, who present business model fundamentals. Sign up for that and we'll see you next week. Um, please take a quick minute to fill out that survey if you have not. Uh, and we'll be in touch with slides for everybody. Um, and until next week, see everybody. Thanks.